Good, good morning, everyone. It is a little after 930. Um, we had a little bit of technical difficulties on our end. So um, apologies for being a little bit late, but we are here. Um, I am Sam with NATP and I am joined today with Tom O'Saban. Tom is our newest um, director of tax content and government relations. Tom, thanks for being here with me today. How are thanks, you? Sam. I'm doing well. How are you this morning? Good. You had a busy weekend um, reading over the latest news of what we're going to be talking about today, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so let's just jump, dive right in if you're up for that. Sure. High level, um, what, what is this act? What does it do? Um, just very high level, tell us about it. Okay, very good. Well, first of all, uh, folks are going to get confused when you look at the acronym we use for this law. When we talk about the, it's supposed to be the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA for short. So we get that confused within, you know, individual retirement accounts. So don't get, don't get that confusion. Maybe something will come out differently that we can use later on. So the idea being is that this is part of President Biden's original Build Back Better proposal but it, it really is just a kind of a microcosm of that. And there are some tax provisions that will, will impact your clients. So I think those are the um, important things to get into right now. Now, one caveat is that we're still kind of digesting the law. The, the Senate passed it um, a Friday or so ago, which was at whatever that was, August the uh, 5th, I guess. Oh, oh sorry, yes, yeah, the Senate. Yeah, 5th, and then the House took it up and voted on it on Friday the 12th. Yeah, just this past, Sam, you're right. And then the president has yet to sign it. So we don't have a law yet, but we do have a number of provisions I think that, that tax professionals will, will need to be aware of. And we think about this, there's some, there's some very, very high level taxes, for example. There is a 15% minimum tax on corporate financial statement income. In other words, the statements that they generate internally for their, for their own use or for the use with their board of directors. But this is only going to impact companies where their, their net profit or their gross sales, excuse me, I should go the other way, their income is more than a billion dollars. So I think for a lot of our practitioners, that's not going to apply. And then the second thing that we're looking at right now is financial statement income isn't the same thing as tax return income. So a couple of proposals that said, well, financial statement income doesn't include things like depreciation or the election to write off assets early. Well, the final version appears to include the ability to take those deductions. So we'll have to see. I think, again, that's not going to impact uh, too many of our practitioners and their clients. Again, gross sales of more than a billion dollars. There's also a 1% tax that's being placed upon corporations for doing stock buybacks. Again, that would normally ha happen in a larger company. Just throw out somebody like Amazon or Google or IBM who may want to buy back stock from shareholders and there'll be a 1% tax. How that's calculated, we don't know at this point, whether it would be on the market value of that stock or an average of a market value as to when the date goes out. But those are, those are some big end uh, revenue raisers. A couple of things that, that will be of interest to practitioner Sam will be one, you might recall in the American Rescue Plan that President Biden signed in March, remember March during tax season in 2021, one of the big provisions in there was to look at people who buy their health insurance on the healthcare marketplace. Now that point is really, really important. What I'm gonna talk about doesn't, doesn't address health insurance in general, it addresses those who go out to the marketplace and buy their health insurance. Now, that being said, what we used to have for years is no one was entitled to premium assistance if their household income was more than four times the poverty line for that size of family in that area. Well, the American Rescue Plan for tax years 21 and 22, so it's in effect right now, for 21 and 22 said, we're gonna get rid of this 400%, what I called a tripwire. In other words, if you hit that, boom, you didn't, you didn't get any premium assistance, and if you had received any premium assistance, you'd owe it all back. Mm -hmm. So the law that the American Rescue Plan did was, okay, again, those who purchase their health insurance on the marketplace only, they should not be expected to pay more than 8.5% of their household income for their health insurance. Mm -hmm. So that provision was in effect for 21 and also 22, scheduled to expire at the end of this year. Well, that's been continued 
through 2025 by action of IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. We're going to have to start getting, getting used to that. So those provisions were forget about that 400% tripwire. We're going to have 8% of household income. And I believe there's also maybe some provisions, we're still kind of digesting this, that maybe that 8.5% would be adjusted for inflation. So that maybe it's 9.1%, et cetera, in future years. So we're going to have that for three more years. But let me, let me throw out a caveat to those who are participating today and for our clients. 8.5% doesn't mean that someone would not owe back some of their premium assistance. Again, when people go to the marketplace and purchase their health insurance, they make a projection about what their income is going to be. Well, if they way under projected the reality of what their income is and they received premium assistance, well, they could still owe some of that back when they go ahead and file their tax returns. But short run, we have this provision, looks like it's extended through the end of 2025. Again, think of the American Rescue Plan, that provision now being extended for those who purchase their health insurance on, on the marketplace. Another provision we had that goes all the way back to the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, and you think, Sam, when I say all the way back, and I'm talking about 2018, that sounds like ancient history. Yeah. One of the things that we had that got changed and brought back was something called excess business losses. In other words, if a business used the provisions that were provided by the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, and they wrote off too much in the way of equipment um, or other costs they may have had in their business, they were limited on how much they could take. I think it was originally 250,000 uh, losses limit for filing statuses other than married filing jointly, 500,000, and then that was adjusted for inflation. Well, that's mm -hmm. 2018. Well, then we have the pandemic comes along. Mm -hmm. And during the pandemic, we had, for example, the CARES Act. The CARES Act said, well, those excess business losses, forget about it for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So they were <laughs> gone for 18, 19, and 20, then they came back in 2021. So for those clients who have excess business losses, what happens is if that, when you're doing planning with clients, if the losses are gonna to be too big, they actually, it's almost like a zebra changing its stripes. It changes its stripes and it becomes a net operating loss going forward. Okay, hmm. well, provisions of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act were supposed to expire at the end of 2025. Mm -hmm. The American Rescue Plan took that excess business loss provision and said, we're going to extend it for one year, okay, through 2026. Again, this sounds like a long time in the future, but it really isn't. So then, we have that provision, along comes IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, excess business losses, adjusted for inflation now. So we're in the 260, 275 area, 550 or so for married couples filing jointly. That excess business loss provision, which makes it change its stripes if there's too big a loss, and then becomes a net operating loss going forward, will be extended for two more years. So through 2027 appears all the way to 2028. I could be wrong on that, but that's a provision to be aware of for those clients who maybe get, uh, I don't want to say carried away, but they've got a lot of Section 179 or bonus depreciation that they, that they wish to take. Another one of the uh, provisions is dealing with the area of energy credits. And there, there's a, a whole variety of energy credits going on. The first one dealing with, I'm going to call them non-traditional vehicles. In other words, ones that are powered not by my uh, Dodge Challenger's V8 engine that gets five miles a gallon. I'm kidding. I used to have one <laughs> years ago. But uh, we're talking about electric vehicles, hydrogen powered, hybrids. Now, we've had credits for a while on new vehicles. Well, those credits have been extended all the way out to 2032. So again, uh -huh. sounds like a long way, but it looks like they're gonna be extended to 2032, up to $7,500, which is what we had before for a maximum. But mm -hmm. there's a couple of caveats that I have to say, Sam, mm -hmm. I don't have precise answers yet, and this okay. is what I mean. One, there's a limitation on how much the car can cost mm. to maximize this credit. Okay. Secondly, there's going to be income limitations for the family in terms of how, how much they can, they can qualify for credit-wise. So we've got, we got those, those two limitations involved too. It says in the bill 
that the final assembly of the automobile needs to be in North America. Now, I don't have a definition of North America that I have yet that we're going to have to get guidance on. Does that mean sure. the United States only? Does it, make the, does it mean the U.S. and Canada? Does mm -hmm. it mean the U.S., Canada, and Mexico? I don't know. But right mm -hmm. now it says final assembly has to be in the United States. And again, these credits are carried out then all the way through 2032. It, it, um, an important provision to consider. I was just reading it a little while ago, looking at some of the law, and you may have clients right now that have entered into a contract to buy a vehicle. Mm -hmm. And it won't be delivered perhaps until 2023. By what I'm reading in the law, that client would be eligible for the credit. So here's a wrinkle that we have not had before in this area of, again, non-traditionally fueled vehicles. Used vehicles are going to qualify for up to a $4,000 credit. Now you had $7,500 maximum. Uh, now we're looking at a $4,000 credit for used vehicles. Again, it did not exist before. We're going to have this issue that I think they have to be more than two years old. Okay. And there's a limitation again on their cost. I think there's a, I saw something about $30,000. I don't know what a used hybrid, for example, would, would cost. I've not priced any, uh, but yet we have this credit. And again, that's going all the way through 20, 2032. So we have some credits out there. Again, I'll call them for the non-traditionally fueled vehicles. Here's an interesting wrinkle, Sam, that in, in the law or in the, in the proposed legislation, it says, Starting in 2024, when people go and buy their vehicle at the dealership, they can get the credit then. So in other words, they kind of assign the credit over to the dealer. So then they can, they can have it right then instead of waiting until they file their tax return. It'll be interesting to me to see how that works in reality, because on the one hand, you know, we've got you know, qualifying vehicles and all that kind of stuff, but then there's that income requirement mm -hmm. and i don't know if all of a sudden now in the car dealership they're going to have some format to follow which says here's your projected income and how much of this credit would you get but be aware folks out there out there paying attention that we have a circumstance where the individual when they purchase their vehicle may be getting the credit right there at the dealership mm -hmm. as part of the paperwork that they do but again not proposed to be until until 2024 so okay. another, in, another area of energy credits, which again, I don't have full answers on, are those improvements that people do to their homes. Now we've had credits around for a long time. You might remember things like insulation, exterior mm -hmm. doors, uh, water heaters, high efficiency furnaces. And every time in the past, when that law would come up for um, renewal, it carried this $500 lifetime limit. Well, what I'm reading in the Inflation Reduction Act is dealing with something called $1,200. Now, what I don't know yet, and we, we don't know yet, and we're going to have to find out, and we'll, of course, share summaries through our various social media platforms. We'll probably put a summary together once the president signs. So mm -hmm. pay attention and watch for what's that definition going to be when we talk about this $1,200. Is that a new $1,200 or is that encompassing of this lifetime $500 limit? Now, a couple other things I saw that didn't exist before. There are, well, I'm going to say the word credit, but I'm not sure if that's the right term when people are looking at appliances. There's, in mm. fact, discussion of rebates or credits for appliances. Now, uh, kind of sensitive to that because over the years I've had people would get a new dishwasher or a new refrigerator or a new stove that says, hey, the salesman at the store said this is eligible for a credit. Well, that may have been a rebate. So sure. I think that's the thing we have to watch for too, that we may be looking at rebates and not necessarily income tax credits that are gonna, right. gonna be available. Sometimes those are from the manufacturer. Sometimes they come from the state. But I did notice a couple little wrinkles in the work you might do to your home. There's numbers assigned to things like windows. But previously, mm -hmm. I had not seen in federal law a discussion about things like a stove or in this case I actually wrote it down if someone goes and improves their electrical service coming in you know like mm -hmm. their breaker their breaker box mm -hmm. uh, there can be credits for those and typically again it used to be insulation exterior mm -hmm. windows exterior doors uh, not siding not roofs 
Uh, those, those are not, those are still not here, but I'm seeing a little bit of expansion that again, we're going to have to delve into that law a little, a little bit deeper. Hmm. For those taxpayers who spend more money and they, and they do some, some real energy efficient improvements to their homes, such as solar, wind, geothermal, mm -hmm. those projects are, are pretty darn expensive. Mm -hmm. We had a 30% credit, 30% of the cost of the project including installation, and that was beginning now in 2022 to phase down. We were down to 26% and then they were dropping off. Well, 30% has been reinstated and that also appears to be carrying out for about the next 10 years. I say for about the next 10 years, I don't, I don't want to appear vague, but in some places I see expiring at the end of 2032, other places I see expiring at the end of 2034. Now, if, if you think a couple of years and all the tax law changes we've had since 2018, 10 years from now is a really, really long time in tax law. So again, that can change, but be aware for those clients who are contemplating those, those more expensive projects, like I said, the solar, wind, geothermal type projects, looks like we're going to get that full 30% credit back as opposed to the phase out that we were living in up until the time this, this act becomes uh, a law as opposed to mm -hmm. just just legislation mm -hmm. well sam mm -hmm. i haven't talked about something that's getting all the attention in the media yes i think i know where you're going with this <laughs> i think you i think you do know what's the deal with all of a sudden all of the talk we hear about the irs is coming to knock on your door you knew exactly mm -hmm. where i was going didn't you sam okay yes yep <laughs> yeah tell it us about is this. true okay. yes Go ahead, Sam. I'm sorry. Oh, we've been hearing a lot about this, so do tell we, what we sure is have. actually going to happen. What, what, we we're trying, what we're trying to do for, for you folks is to not, not deal with salacious headlines, okay? Yes, it is true that the IRS, beyond their normal funding in this law, is looking at another $80 billion of funding over the next 10 years. That's about $8 billion extra funding per, per year. Well, Certainly, the IRS needs some assistance. You know, they've got this huge backlog to deal with. They don't have the staffing. They don't have the technology. So a lot of this money is going to go toward additional, hopefully additional resources that the IRS is able to hire to go ahead and address the backlog, get the phones answered, get your questions answered, and again, to provide the service that they intend to provide. So they've been in a real tough budgetary a situation for some for some time. Now, I have to believe that also too, you know, money is going to be used to help enforce the laws. Now, mm -hmm. that's where our job really, really becomes important with our clients to make sure that yes, there is a likelihood that there will be more IRS correspondence. There will be more IRS scrutiny of taxpayers' submissions. So mm -hmm. it really behooves us to say, okay. We've always, we always should have been prepared at any time to be even that kind of that random audit type situation. So we encourage our clients to make sure they keep good documentation of, mm -hmm. of their deductions and the credits they're claiming and to make sure they retain that information. And also we have lots of tools for you out there who are participating today available for you to, for you to kind of bone up on your your knowledge about how to answer IRS correspondence, how to address an audit. So I'm not going to say that that's not going to happen mm -hmm. because I, I, I believe that's part of the funding and, and part, of, part of the mandate. Now, there's another provision I want to talk about where with, within the funding to the IRS, where there's $15 million for the IRS to study the expansion of free file. Now, you know mm -hmm. the free file system has been around for a while. And this past summer, Elizabeth Warren proposed, Senator Elizabeth Warren proposed that the IRS should make available to taxpayers what information the IRS already has. So let's say, Sam, you want to go ahead and file your return. You go to the IRS website and say, after you do your protected logins and all that, here's the information they've got. My W-2, this kind of information. And if all that's accurate, what Senator Warren would like to see is that people should be able to go ahead and just say, yeah, I check a box under penalties of perjury that my information is accurate and go ahead and my return is filed. Now, mm -hmm. I do believe that we are probably several years away 
from that kind of program being implemented. Mm -hmm. But both uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen and Senator Warren mentioned that they believe that upwards of 70% of taxpayers should be able to file under this type of a system. Hmm. I bet I just got your attention for those of you who are paying attention today or, pay, or, or participating in our, mm -hmm. in our call. 70% of people can possibly file their own returns. Now, what does that mean for the future of the tax professional? Well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that, that um, taxpayers need they need someone they can turn to for advice. Mm -hmm. And they need the advice of a seasoned professional, goes to the tools we offer through NATP, to become more versed in areas like small businesses or rental properties or other areas mm -hmm. or dealing with investments or, or mm -hmm. cybersecurity or, or um, different, different types of digital, digital assets. So we can provide knowledge and advice to clients. Now, Sam, mm -hmm. I've said for a long time, and I've been, in, I've been a practitioner, I don't like to admit it, but 32, <laughs> 32 years, and I've been an instructor in various ways for the last 20 years, mm -hmm. and I've told people for a long time that the world of filing simple returns, by simple returns where maybe we don't even have any dependents, we've got a couple of W-2s, those types of returns eventually will become a mechanical operation maybe by the IRS. In other words, they don't need a practitioner. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that people don't need advice and that mm -hmm. they don't need assistance with making sure they pay the least amount of tax the law allows. So I'll tell you on the one hand, this may be, this may be controversial to say, but I think the IRS needs funding. They need mm -hmm. funding in order to do the job that they're, they are there to do. They can't provide the, the, for the third part of their name, service. Mm -hmm. like they can't answer the phone. They can't get the backlog dealt with. They can't get their mm -hmm. systems updated because they haven't had the money to do that. Yep. So a great deal of the investment that Congress is making, that we the taxpayers are making in the IRS is in fact to update their systems. I think, you know what, I got to say, I think they've done a marvelous job of implementing what they've had to do with the number of laws we've had with the stimulus mm -hmm. payments and everything, but they can only do so much. So mm -hmm. a lot of those dollars are going to go to hopefully people having a better experience. And that, mm -hmm. and that being said, I'd also encourage folks to look at establishing online tax pro accounts for access to your client's information. Assist your client with getting their online information set up, and then you as a tax pro can have access to that. And you don't mm -hmm. have to try, to try to get through on the phones and then find out you don't have a power of attorney on file, mm -hmm. et, et cetera. So, Mm -hmm. that's a that's a big provision I don't mean it I'm not taking the side of the IRS I'm not taking any side I'm just mm -hmm. basically stating facts but yes I think you need to prepare your clients to make sure that when they provide you with some numbers that they've got the backup to support it in the event that the IRS would make inquiry there's going to be more of that the sheriff mm -hmm. is back in town we'll say mm -hmm. we'll, we'll Which, uh, oh, go ahead Pam would you say that this would also be maybe a good time then for those tax preparers who are interested to explore, you know, getting a designation to be able to then correspond with the IRS directly? You know, that's an excellent, an excellent point that isn't addressed in this law, Sam, but I'll tell you, we dealt with the notion of licensing tax practitioners. Uh, it's been a little bit more than 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. And mm -hmm. one of the suggestions at that time was, if you don't have a professional designation, yes, I, I understand, folks. Some of you have been in practice for 30, 40 years. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't have a professional designation. I understand that. But professional designations uh, help to at least show the government that there's a minimum level of continuing education every year. Mm -hmm. So if you were to, for example, consider becoming an enrolled agent, I've been an enrolled agent since 1994. It's been a long time. <laughs> And I, I'm happy to renew that every three years because it was one of the toughest tests I ever took. I will mm -hmm. tell you that the Office of Professional Responsibility, when we had Karen Hawkins there, Karen is now retired. I remember her telling me, I was at a, um, an IRS forum in San Diego. She said, people need to get their enrolled agent sooner than later because we're going to make that test tougher. And oh. let me tell you, I used to be in the securities business. I was a registered principal. Mm -hmm. None of that compared to taking that enrolled agent exam. So, um, again, we've got tools to we help do. people to, to take that, to get that designation, 
because I think licensing of preparers is coming. So mm -hmm. this might be the time to get that professional designation because I think the other thing that clients are going to be looking for, even if they prepare their own taxes, what mm -hmm. are they going to do if they get, I, they get IRS correspondence? They're going to be looking for someone to represent them. And if you're not, if you don't carry a professional designation like an enrolled agent, a CPA, or an attorney, then if you are an annual uh, filing season practitioner, you can only represent the returns you prepare. So mm -hmm. if you want to be able to provide additional services to clients, then you should really consider uh, becoming an enrolled agent. You really can't, if you, don't, if you don't have the background in accounting and an accounting degree, you really can't become a CPA, a certified public accountant. But the enrolled agent designation, which has been around for a long, long, long time, um, mm -hmm. is typically considered a tax designation. So I'd strongly consider more education because that's what clients, listen, no matter what happens with the government, mm -hmm. giving advice never goes out of style. Mm -hmm. and, and helping people never goes out of style. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's, important to, that's important to consider as, as we go through this. And we do have a question that came in, Tom, if you're up for taking it um, sure. from Monique. Will the solar credit be retroactive for installs done in 2022? Do we know that information? I, I saw your question, Monique, and I was thinking about it as, as I read it. I believe that it is retroactive, although until the president signs the bill and the ink is dry, we, we don't know exactly. I'm assuming, and I hate to assume, but I, I have not seen anything that says for tax years after. Uh, I, I would expect after um, you know, enactment of the law, but that's where I would watch for us to come out with our summary of the final law signed by President Biden to answer that question. I'm assuming it, but I don't really like to assume mm -hmm. on there. Right, yes, that, that's a very good caveat too. We mentioned that a couple of mm -hmm. times, but just to reiterate, this has not been yet signed by President Biden. So we are still waiting on that um, for anything to be absolutely final. Um, but are, Tom, are we expecting big changes as of right now? Would would we expect much to I don't. change? I don't think so, Sam, but it's always mm -hmm. those those effective dates, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes the effective dates, we have to understand that there's there's accounting and then there's government accounting. So sure. if the gov in government accounting, if something doesn't take effect for a while, it, do it doesn't exist as an expense. So mm -hmm. if you think about that, if you took out a mortgage today and you say, well, I'm really not in debt for two hundred thousand dollars because I haven't paid it yet. You know, that's sure. kind of how the government thinks. So some of this stuff, it gets into this budget reconciliation. And if it doesn't take effect until here, that's, you know, it, it, they're big into kicking the can down the road. And I'm not knocking Congress. I mean, it's the system. It's the system we have. But mm -hmm. um, I'm not absolutely positively sure because I saw two different two different statements there. And I'm thinking, well, is this effective at, after date of enactment? Then I saw something 180 days after enactment. Okay. Yeah, so there's a possibility, Monique. So keep keep your eyes and ears open to the things that we will post our Tax Pro mm -hmm. Weekly. Again, we yeah. might put out a, a, a summary a summary sheet on the law once we know it's exactly set in stone as much as it can be. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I would I would watch for some some tweaks. But the main takeaways again are that health insurance uh, eight and a half percent for people who buy their insurance on the marketplace. We do have energy credits. Oh, let me tell you a couple of things, Sam, before I forget. What we yeah. didn't get out of this, and I was surprised, in the American Rescue Plan, we saw that expansion of the child tax credit, mm -hmm. and we saw it actually become refundable. We saw mm -hmm. expansion of dependent care. My goodness, the, the money that I see that people spend on daycare. My son, by the way, turned 32 today, so it's been a yeah. long time since <laughs> I've had anybody in daycare, and it was awful way back when, but it's mm -hmm. really awful today. Yeah, I can speak from experience. <laughs> I, I know you can, Sam. I know you can. You and I and I and I feel your pain. I really do. Mm -hmm. But the point I'm but the point I'm trying to make um, is that those provisions were not extended. We do we we've snapped back. So those American Rescue Plan changes to the child tax credit were back to the way it was before. The dependent care credit were back to the way it was before. So those provisions were not in the Inflation Reduction Act. And Sally, I saw that you posted that a summary sheet would be helpful. And yes, we will be doing that. I promise you that. Yeah, we just don't, 
We just don't have it today for this broadcast because again, mm -hmm. president hasn't signed yet. So we have to wait until the absolute ink dries. And I know Sam, I'm not expecting big changes, but I sometimes worry about when those effective dates, if there's any kind of, of coordination that has to be done between the House and the Senate versions. I believe that's yeah. been done, but the final signature is never assured until final signature. Right. Yeah. And you never, you know, the, as they say, the devil is in the details. So one Bingo. little thing could be changed that could actually have a huge implication that perhaps people don't think about or notice. So like, um, like Tom said, we will keep you updated. Uh, this is what we know. As of right now, it is Monday. We are live at 10 a.m. Central Time, August 15th. Um, Tom, before we go, any any other last words, parting thoughts, any advice for tax preparers as we, you know, unbelievably start preparing to prepare? <laughs> Absolutely. And again, I, I you're, you're you're right, Sam. And I think about that and think, you know, we we're coming up on extension deadlines. So let's not forget about those. If you've got cool. Any corporations or partnerships on extension, September 15th is right around the corner. Any trusts you might have on extension, they're due September 30th. And of course, then we've got October 15th, or I'm, I'm, I don't have a calendar right in front of me to see if uh, October 15th falls on a weekend, but somewhere right around there would be the extensions of the individual returns. And no sooner do we get done with that, then we're right back into the frying pan into another, <laughs> another filing, into another filing season. So. Pay attention to the emails that we sent out, the information that we that we sent out. We we try to make it as timely as possible so you can be prepared to face your to face your clients in another in another tax season. So yeah, not forgetting that, well, the summer the summer is almost over. And so mm -hmm. um I uh I, I think we need to be prepared and I think uh that's the most that's the most important thing. Don't forget that we have all kinds of education opportunities this fall. We have our traditional tax season updates. That's also available virtual. We have three tax forums coming up, Atlantic City, Orlando, and, and Las Vegas. A lot of good education. And of course, there's plenty of, plenty of study opportunities you can do right from the comfort of your own home or like me and my, my uh, little home office here coming to you from Champaign, Illinois. And uh, I encourage you to stay on top of what's going on and We'll be there for you and we'll give you as much information and we want it to be accurate um, mm -hmm. as well and interpretations mm -hmm. as they come through as quickly as they become available. Yes, so Sam, absolutely. thank you for having me on this morning and thank you for all, all who participated and stay tuned. We'll have more information to give you. Absolutely. Thanks again, Tom. Have a great day, everyone. Bye now. Bye.